It is late November, 1998. In a few short months, the Sabbat, the Sword of Cain, will rampage their way up the east coast of the United States, destroying Elysia, slaughtering Camarilla Kindred, and claiming more territory for their sect than they have in a hundred years. Preparations for this bloody campaign are underway in almost every Sabbat domain on the planet. Our story focuses on the Blood Covenant, a newly formed pack whose recent accomplishments have earned them great status, but the leaders of the Sabbat wish to see them tested further. They will be sent to Montreal, the spiritual heart of the Sword of Cain. There, they will learn from the scholars and paragons, strengthening their spirits and becoming a more perfect weapon for Cain's army and the dire tasks that will be asked of them in the bloody nights to come. But a great darkness festers in that northern city, and only time will tell these Cainites are capable of resisting the corruption that threatens to destroy them from without and from within. My name is Scott Cuban. I am the head storyteller of Simulacra Studios, and I'd like to thank you for listening to this preview of Blood Covenant, a V5 Sabbat story. This game and podcast came about because we wanted to play around with the V5 mechanics regarding hunger, humanity, and touchstones within the context of the Sabbat. Additionally, we wanted to play in one of our favorite time periods of Vampire the Masquerade, the late 90s, adjacent to the time and events of the clan novel saga. We also wanted the chance to pull out one of our favorite old black dog books, Montreal by Night. Those familiar with that book may notice that things are a little different in this version of the World of Darkness. The timeline has been progressed by a few years, and some of the details are not what you might remember. There are new faces, and some people might not fill the same role as they do in the book. We did this because we always like to take what White Wolf has given us and change it just enough to make it our own. We've also decided to produce this actual play much more like an audio drama. We've edited out most of the dice rolls, added music, sounds, and other enhancements to make it feel a bit more immersive. We've assembled a really great group of players for this game, some of whom you may recognize from other Simulacra Studio productions, as well as other members of the family and the online tabletop world. A quick note. Some of our characters' backstories include some sensitive material, which may not be suitable for all listeners. Specifically, there is suicide, ritual murder, and illicit drugs. So without further ado, let's introduce you to the pack and the people who play them. Let's start with James. James, please introduce yourself and tell us who you play. Hey everybody, I'm James Davey. I am the player of Charles Two Buck Chisholm, better known as Buck. And where might people know you from, James? Well, people would know me from a lot of things around the LARP community, but I have uh, recently broken up with LARP more or less, uh, and what people would most likely recognize me from, or at least I hope they would, is my horror tabletop RPG that my brother and I are in the process of launching. It's called The Midnight World. You can find us at www.themidnightworld.com. You can find us uh, at Facebook. Just search The Midnight World. We're on Twitter at The Midnight World. And we are most of the way through the production process. We should have books in print by summer. I've had the distinct pleasure of playing The Midnight World. It's a fantastic game. I really encourage everyone out there to take a look at it. And I can't wait until it's out in the world. I'm excited about it, too. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Buck? Who is this guy? One of the reasons that my brother and I made The Midnight World is that we we see role-playing, by and large, as a way to sort of test out feelings that we ourselves have, have had, poor coping mechanisms that we've struggled with, stuff like that in a safe environment where it's not dangerous to to sort of play around with these ideas. And so Buck specifically, for me, is is an extension of that kind of idea. He is badly depressed. I do struggle with depression and anxiety, and Buck does too. Buck also struggles with the sort of modern toxic masculinity of today's cis male and trying to shed that in a way that is both 
not hurtful for his own psyche, but also in some way preservative of the identity he has spent his life building. So it's a lot of playing around with depression and anxiety and reinventing yourself. And that's kind of what he represents in play. So can you tell me a little bit about his life? Also, how did he end up becoming a vampire? Uh, so it's it's a bit grim, but Buck struggled for a very long time. He was he was the most popular guy in his high school in a small town in Georgia, and then uh, high school was over, and all the other people went out into the world and got degrees and got jobs, and Buck failed to launch, and he couldn't figure out who he was or what he wanted, and he saw all of the people in his life that had really been subordinates to him in high school passing him by. And so he eventually fell into addiction and fell into alcoholism and finally decided to end it all. And he did so in the woods near one of his favorite hunting places and was discovered while his body was still warm by a a Sabat gangrel who thought, here's one for the front lines, more or less, and, and brought him back for that purpose. That is definitely some rough and dark stuff, and it has been very compelling to play with a character that's so deeply in the black. But while we haven't really detailed much of this period out, he does eventually make his way into the Blood Covenant, which is the pack where the rest of the PCs are in. How would you describe his place in the pack? I think Buck's place is very much one of, I guess, the The best way to describe it is that he is very much an adolescent who is trying to learn who he is and what his place is going to be in this greater world. You know, he's still got a lot of that. He is a loyalist and he behaves very much as one. He's still got a lot of that willful defiance used to be aimed at dad. Now it's aimed at the nearest thing he's got to dad, which is the pack ductus leon and we have a relationship that is i think it's fair to say antagonistic (laughs) but also evolving and I, i guess that's his place his place is he is there to test the living daylights out of the power structure of the pack but also to be sort of their barometer for whether or not they have succeeded because if they can save buck from himself then and turn him into a glorious warrior that holds the sword then you know, I, th- I think their journey as as leaders who want to be effective and good at, at fighting Kane's war, they can point to that and say, yeah, look, we did it. We're, we're awesome. That has certainly been sort of a rough game to referee between the two of you. But I do think that that relationship between you and Leon is very compelling. And, and it's something that I think a lot of people can latch on to and comprehend the parent and child, commander and subordinate that are at loggerheads with one another. But how would you describe your relationship with the pack priest, with Paisley? Uh, I think that the pack priest and Buck are, have a much more cordial, and I don't even, I want to say cordial, I want to say if Leon is Buck's dad with whom, you know, Buck has finally realized maybe I'm big enough to take a swing at dad, Paisley is the mom that Buck would do anything for. And in, in a way, they are models of his actual parents because anybody who was raised in a deep southern toxically masculine home knows dad was the one that there was a a combative relationship with and mom was the one that you'd kind of yes ma'am and and set the table and do anything she told you to do Uh, and so I've, i've tried to keep that going with with paisley and with her being a malkavian anti tribu with her background that level of strange madness definitely adds its own kind of toxicity to that relationship. Doesn't it just? (laughs) So in keeping with the family motif, how would you describe your relationship with your siblings, for lack of a better term, with Reggie and with Layla? I think that Buck and Reggie, Buck sees Reggie very much as, yeah, the way that he would see a younger brother who's, you know, into some some weird stuff that that I don't he goes into the city sometimes and he hangs out with strange people but but I also I I think that Buck loves him in in as much of a way as Buck is capable of that sort of an emotion cares deeply about him is interested in seeing him succeed I think the uh, the relationship between Buck and Layla is much more ride or die sort of 
both rebels, both trying to prove something in a way. So I, I definitely do see the relationship between Buck and Reggie and Layla as being very, very much like a brothers and sisters relationship. And something that I find very interesting is how the Valdery affects all of this. You know, the, the sort of the mystical underpinning that binds this unit together. You know, the ratings fell as they fell as per the dice rolls, but it's been very interesting to see how that has affected things. I've definitely noticed places where it's influenced how these characters interact with one another. Right. And lastly... I would really like to know from your perspective, based on the game sessions that we've recorded so far, how would you characterize Buck's journey or his personal story? So I think, you know, uh, I I subscribe in my story writing. I don't want to come off as pretentious, but (laughs) uh, in my particular story writing, I subscribe to uh, sort of a Harmon-esque story wheel. I I really like the way that, that Dan Harmon puts his story structure together. And I try to stick to that when I'm telling uh, basically any story. So, you know, you've, you, Buck started in a position of relative comfort in that he had this pack and, you know, he was sort of figuring things out. Then he got his call to action being sent to Vancouver, and Toronto, Canada. I don't know, somewhere in Canada, Montreal. I knew I was going to hit it eventually. And, and now he's in that sort of phase of going under and going in. So he's, and, and I really appreciate it. I, I don't think that you caught this, but in the episode where you took me inside the mountain, that actually, that moment where, and, and I, I I don't, who am I talking to? Of course, I know that you caught this, but that, that moment where he went into the mountain and into his own mind, that, that literally was the part of the journey where he is going internal and figuring himself out. He's, he's found what he has to do. Now he's in this sort of training montage portion of the story where he learns all that he will need to be able to complete this story. And then, of course, I don't have to tell you that he's going to hopefully meet the requirements that he has and then pay a huge price for it. That is how those things do tend to go. And you have definitely teased some stuff that will probably be showing up in Season 2, so I'm glad that you put that out there for the listeners to look forward to. And now let's move on to Mo. Mo, please tell the world about you. Well, first and foremost, it is me, Mo. If you know me at all in the like role-playing space, I'm one half of the Duets with Dice team. Me and uh, Austin sort of do two-player games. I am also sometimes a guest on the Surprise Round channel and very often a player on the Simulacra TV channel. Yes, well, we do certainly love you here on the channel. Oh, yes. Now, if you would please tell us about Layla. Who is this mysterious creature of the night? So... I wanted Layla to sort of be a newly, she is like fresh off that cult mentality from like full Sedite integration. Like that was her entire life. And in this game, we're sort of experiencing her first, like, I think she's only been out for like less than a year. And so this is sort of her experiencing Sabbat culture after being entrenched in Sedite culture her entire life. Yeah, it is kind of out of one cult into a much bigger and more violent cult. And that's definitely how she looks at it. She's like, oh, you know, I've lived with it for so long. I like can't live without the structure. I kind of need it to like get through these long, endless nights. And so that's definitely what I'm playing right now and that's sort of where I'm at in the pack is this person who isn't it's not like if a fledgling is introduced right off to the sabbat they sort of get to have that well this is like all I know all vampires are like this right but she doesn't have that so she's new to the sabbat but she's not new to vampire shit Yeah, and so when people are explaining the rituals and the different sets and all of the different ins and outs and rite of the Sabbat, she's like, okay, okay, I'm kind of jiving. Wait, that doesn't track. But she's not going to say that doesn't track because she learned first off, number one, you don't say if it doesn't track. You keep that shit to yourself. (laughs) 
And she's also in a fairly unique position in that, unlike most of them, she's not really struggling with her inhumanity or her beast because she's already on a path that sort of sets her aside from the majority of the pack. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's very secure in who she is because she does already have a extensive background in living as a vampire. And so, you know, she sort of gets to watch other members of this pack really, really struggle with the loss of the people they were before. And, you know, when they go through it, she is, you know, sympathetic. She's like, oh, man, that really sucks. But I haven't had to deal with feelings like that since I was alive. Ugh, cute. So speaking of the pack, how do you think Layla fits in with the group? What do you see as her place in this makeshift, mystically bound family? I do feel like, especially now, she is very new to this. Well, I, the pack in general is pretty new as far as I'm aware, but I feel like she's in this sort of space where she is receptive to being taught and is has moved into the role of being a student and also a cheerleader for other people. Uh, you know, she feels like She's like, it's okay. Some people in this pack don't like me. That's all right. You know, I'll I'll verbally tell you I emotionally support you while like spitting on your shadow when you're not like looking at me. Your use of the word shadow makes me think that you have a specific pack member in mind in relation to that behavior. I feel like between me, between me and the pack ductus Leon, there's a little bit of friction there. It's in a lot of ways unspoken but I feel like we jab at each other a lot but because I'm not like openly confrontative it's just light enough of a jab to irritate but never enough to have someone fly off the handle at me that's other people's job other people can do that they do that all day all night I'm like oh you shouldn't have said that I wouldn't have said I wouldn't have challenged him that way I'd have been softer about it so that sums up your relationship with Leon the Ductus. What about with Paisley, the pack priest? How would you characterize how she and Layla get on? Oh, I feel like in right immediately, Paisley and Layla share cult-like environments in their human life. They have this in common. And like sisters, they have bonded over, over a shared fucked up background. They're both like, you too? Yeah, me too. Ah, they just like Spider-Man pointing at each other. Yeah, no, me and, me and Paisley, Layla and Paisley, uh, we get along just excellently. She's like, she's like scary, but she's like cute. That does seem to sum her up fairly well. What about with Reggie? How does Layla approach her relationship with Reggie? Uh, for Reggie... Reggie just seems like such a plain Jane kind of guy to me where Layla just wants to like show him how like great things can be because he's explained to her his you know recent background of also coming into the Sabbat and like the life of the undead recently she's like man think of all the fun shit you haven't gotten to do in your unlife yet like, you've already been alive, or you've already been undead for so long, and you haven't done this and this and this and this. Come on, man. Let's live or die. Exist. <laughs> yeah, Reggie definitely is the youngest member of the pack. He's been dead the least amount of time. So I'm definitely getting kind of a younger brother vibe from how Layla and Reggie interact. Yes. So Leon's the dad, Paisley's my older sister, and Reggie is, like, my little brother that I'm trying to get to do drugs. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah, so classic big sister stuff. That leaves Buck. What's your read on Buck and Layla's relationship? I think of all the people in the pack, Layla's actually more afraid of Buck than she is of Leon, of Paisley, of Reggie, of any of them. 
she always tries to talk to him gently because he feels like a volatile disaster person. And so she'll always give her advice, but has like learned, hey, don't go on too strong. This guy doesn't, he's not receptive to any type of authority, like in any sort of way. So it's oftentimes best just to handle him with kid gloves. And so... Yeah, he's lucky he has a pretty face because if not, she might be like, no, I can't talk to that guy. Uh, He's a good looking dude, but God, he's got fucking issues, you know, says says her. Yeah, from one amoral blood leeching parasite to another. So finally, I'd like to know from your perspective, how do you see Layla's journey through the games that we've recorded so far? What's been her story? I think... She is now more aware of the diversity within the Sabbat. By coming to Montreal, she really has gotten to see how different members of this sect can be. Almost to the point where it feels like there's no way that they could or should have anything to do with each other. And so I think she's becoming more open-minded to the diversity of the new cult she's entering and all of its sub cults and things of that nature. So I feel like her journey is more one of learning than necessarily of self-discovery in the path sort of way. She doesn't really need help controlling her beast. She relishes in seeing the horizon and seeing how wide and wild things are and can be and so that that i think is her her journey within this game so far so from a storyteller perspective i think the thing that i appreciate most about layla is how big of a shit stirrer she is while still maintaining subtlety about playing people against each other and being sort of an instigator. That's been very helpful from the storyteller perspective. So I just cannot wait for everyone out there to meet Layla. Uh, You've really brought something special to the game with her presence. Yes, I'm so excited for everyone to meet this monster. Everyone knows I specialize in monsters. All right, well, let's move on to our long-suffering ductus. Matthew, why don't you tell the world who you are? Who are you? Who is any of us? Well, my name is Matthew Malice. Uh, You may have heard of me if you follow the Polyhedron podcast uh, that I do with Ryan and Scott. So this is kind of an ensemble cast of the Polyhedron crew. And that's maybe where you're at. Uh, I have been also on panels at DragonCon as well as MomoCon. So if you're familiar with those two conventions, you may have seen or heard me there. You probably may have heard me from uh, some Lacra Studios and their other projects, namely D&D and a few other things. Okay, well, why don't you tell me a little bit about Leon? Who is this dark and mysterious man? This mysterious man of shadow and angst. No, no, he is... He is a Lasandra, so that should tell you one thing right there. But like an onion and like Shrek, he is got layers. And, and but he doesn't have a swamp. Not yet. It's aspirational. I can work that in. Uh, not yet. We're working on that. Now, Leon is my idea of what happens if you took basically Booker Bronzy from Godfather, but made him much more sm- smarter, uh, but also a vampire. And so he's kind of. A big, tough, street guy that needs a pack in order to go farther than just being a bruiser. And this is his sort of trial run with Paisley's help uh, in order to sort of move them forward in their um, status. How old is he? As a vampire, he's, I think, 15 years old by this point in the game. But physically, he would was embraced in his early 30s so he is still looking spry and young so you have taken on the role of ductus obviously and then you have paisley 
who is the pack priest. How does that all work out? What What's the relationship between you and the pack like? We're, we're still working on that, as you will hear in these episodes. Uh, as I said, this is an experiment for Leon and Paisley, because they came together. They're the old guard and everyone else is new guard. And we are trying to shepherd them as well as use them, <laughs> to put it mildly. And so the relationship is very strained, as you will hear, uh, between everyone. But Paisley and Leon get away, get along fairly well. There isn't much friction between the two of them. So why did you and Paisley put the pack together? What was the reason behind forming this group of canines? As I said before, they put them together because they they were in a pack together previously, and that pack fell apart. We have not necessarily defined exactly the who, what, where, and why of that, but they, but for Leon's perspective, he formed the pack because he felt it was time for him to be in a leadership position. He could not garner the respect he needed from not just his sire, but from many others without going through the crucible of leading a pack. So it definitely sounds like you have a pretty good relationship with Paisley. What about the other members of the pack? How do you relate to Reggie, Layla, and Buck? They're all strained in their own unique way. Uh, For Layla, that is very much a, I keep her at distance because I know she's, hate to say it, a snake in the grass because they acquired her through her being a turncoat. Though they joined the winning side, of course, but she still betrayed fundamentally her family, and that puts that makes Leon uh, very on edge around her concerning that. It's always seeing if there's an angle that she plays. With Reggie, that's more of like, like this is a very useful tool. He is a tool to Leon. Uh, because he's young, he's extremely smart, almost dangerously smart. Um, but he wants to keep him close because he, but he knows he can rely on Reggie. Like he, he trusts Reggie. He just knows he's very smart and he's still discovering himself. So there's always a, a, a piece that Leon can't just attach himself to. Then we come to Buck. Oh boy, Buck. Oh boy, Buck, indeed. That is the hottest relationship between, and I don't mean that in a uh, evocative or provocative sense. I mean in, is it like, literal temperature. You know, I think we are going to have to let the internet decide just how spicy they're going to make that. I I think we know what they're going to do. (laughs) Um, And so their relationship is very contested. They are on each other's... They're at each other's throats a lot of the time because they have two very different personalities that look at things, and because Leon's old hat is like, there's an order, there's a structure, you follow what you're, you do what you're told to do, and all this, where Buck literally bucks the trend all the time. He's trying to find his own way, and violently so, he is trying to forge his own path, which in the Sabbat can be done, but it also can ruffle a whole bunch of feathers. So lastly, I'd really like to know how you see Leon's story in Blood Covenant. What has been his journey in the game sessions that we've recorded so far? Mm. His arc, and I think this goes telling to Matthew, because it's been a while since I've played Vampire, of like getting to the groove of being a pack, because as just a personal note, I played a lot of Camarilla, and Anarch, but I didn't, I, I played Sabat before, but when you're playing a game, but most of those were LARPs, so playing a game of sit down tabletop where there's only a couple people, it's a much more intimate experience, and so the pack becomes an extremely powerful thing. For Leon and Matthew, it is getting used to the idea that you're not the lone wolf, you, that you have to try to rely on these other people, even though you don't like them. And sometimes you think they're just going to screw up all the time. Well, thanks for talking with me, Matthew. I definitely cannot wait for everyone to get to know Leon and to suffer with him in the struggles of managing a pack like the Blood Covenant. Yes, yes. I'm interested to hear what everyone else has to say about Leon. Oh, one more thing. 
you can find the polyhedron podcast at polyhedron cast on twitter and you can find me on twitter at at bioports yes we definitely want everyone to be reaching out to you matthew in order to second guess and question your every decision as a leader uh, of a pack of bloodthirsty canines that's that's the goal that's what we want you should and i, I expect everyone to hate it all right, next we're going to talk to Rachel, who plays our Malkavian anti-tribu pack priest. Rachel, where might people know you from? You can sometimes and occasionally catch me at Gehenna Gaming, playing fun, spooky things there. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and on TikTok as Super Rat Lord, because rats are the cutest wee bean creatures. Yeah, and I absolutely have to recommend your cosplay and vampire TikToks. Those are just absolutely fire. So definitely go and check those out, everybody. Yeah, that's like for a game called Exeter by Night. There's an actual like TikTok LARP, I guess. Okay, well, let's move on to Blood Covenant. Who do you play in this game? I play Paisley, the ex-Mormon. She's got some darkness. She's a sweet bean, and she's an absolutely, like, so sweet she'll give you a cavity, but, man, there is some darkness in there. So I'm pretty sure that Paisley is the oldest member of the pack in terms of number of years on this cursed earth. Uh, how did she die? What was her embrace like? So the way I had kind of pictured it is, um... The Mormons kind of have like place where you can train to be a missionary. And being a missionary is more of a coming of age thing for the men than it is for women. And I, I was thinking that her training facility got hit by Sabbat because they saw the religious fervor and they wanted something like that. They wanted, you know, who's the best missionaries? <laughs> who's going to be the best missionaries for, you know, the sword? So. She was probably put into a pit with all of the other trainees and had to chew and fight and claw her way out. I imagine that that would cause anyone a truly horrific amount of trauma, but you also got the blood of Malkav as part of your embrace, so that couldn't have helped. Oh yeah, like, I think there's at one point um, where <laughs> Leon's character, or uh, where Matt's character is just like, Cain is not a replacement for Christ, and in K in Paisley's specific Malkavian mind, yes it is, because, praise Cain, like, Dark Father is just a, bra it's just a breath away from Heavenly Father, and in her weird, warped mind, she has received eternity from you know, the blood of Cain and the blood of Malkov. Yeah, and unlike most of the other pack members, you're already on a path. You're on the path of Cain. Oh, yeah, but she falls definitely into that Cain worship sort of ball. Yeah, that certainly is one way that Nautis can go, and I think Paisley represents that very well. But let's move on and talk about where Paisley fits in the pack and also where her story kind of takes her. What's her arc in Blood Covenant? Oh, the arc. She just goes from being like, I don't know, a weird side character to suddenly being mama. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> She's just like, she suddenly becomes mom. And I don't know how this happens, but it sometimes does with my characters. I must have that weird, twisted motherly nature to me that just bleeds into characters. But um, yeah, she starts out as just kind of like the pack priest, but then through Valdery, through, you know, different events, she starts really caring for her pack. And Leon is uh, like, you know, Papa. And then you've got all the pack mates that are the babies. And um, Layla, Layla and Reggie are absolutely the golden children. And then you've got Buck, the problem child, who you're just sitting there like, what are you doing? Yeah, Buck does kind of throw us all for a loop from time to time. Oh god, I love it. But it really seems like as the other characters, as the other members of the pack are struggling with their humanity and trying to find their place on the path, you really come into your own in that mother and priest role. 
Yeah, it, uh, it's it's very interesting. The the less human they become, the more mama I become. <laughs> Just like, oh, you're a bit more messed up now. Come hither, my broken children. Come to me. Well, thanks so much for talking about Paisley with me, Rachel. I really cannot wait for people to meet her. She really is a very unique and terrifyingly sweet character. Oh, she's... what was it? She's a piece of Halloween candy with a razor blade stuck in it. <laughs> that is a frighteningly apt description of her, and I really can't wait to, for everyone to see how true that is. Awesome, and praise game. And last but not least, we come to Ryan, who plays our Zemisi. And yes, that is how I pronounce Zemisi. That's just how it's done on this podcast. I don't want any clapbacks whatsoever. We'll just leave it there. So, Ryan, where would people know you from? Okay, uh, I'm one of the hosts of Polyhedron Podcast with you and and Matt. And uh, I don't have any particular social medias where I engage with anyone anywhere. I'm usually just engaged via the various vehicles where I find where I end up. So through Polyhedron, you know, contact or if one of your patrons just you know really has a burning question for me, I'm sure they'll ask you. Yes, that is definitely possible. Although, the easiest way to get in contact with Ryan or any other member of the cast or myself would be to become a patron at patreon.com slash Studios, and you get access to our private Discord server where you can chat any of us up. But besides the point, Ryan, why don't you tell us a little bit about Reggie? Who is this guy? Oh, Reggie. Poor Reggie. He, he never stood a chance. Uh, Reggie was the son of a strict strict family in, in Austin, Texas, who, were, who aspired to be a surgeon, went pre-med, hated that, finished his degree with a decent background in biochemistry and in or, and organic chemistry, and just sort of finally went to med school, flunked out of that, and then ended up going back to school, taking a tutoring job where he subsequently broke bad and uh, started producing party drugs and founded a, a group that was known as the Lab Rats. You know, Ryan, that sounds awfully familiar. I, I think I may have heard of the Lab Rats before. Can you, can you jog my memory? N- no, no. He was at the night in question, uh, the Vampire Larp uh, put on by Jackalope Productions. He was my, the Lab Rats were a group that we played together there. And Reggie was embraced as a shovelhead who, and was turned by a Zemisi. Yeah, so I was happy when you decided to carry that character over because I really liked him in The Night in Question, and he's been really fun here in Blood Covenant. I think it fit really well. I, he was played him as a ve- very, very cunning and clever, but not exact, and, and a little socially adept. But really, that's what that's what was keeping him alive. Nothing. He had no muscle. He had no brute force other than raw intelligence and, well, a willingness to flout social norms. So how would you describe Reggie's place in the pack, in in the Blood Covenant? Well, he, because of his um, sort of high-strung nature, uh, and he is very high-strung, his powers and disciplines developed to where he has auspects so, you know, the ability to see the unseen here and boost his senses to a point where he acts as a sort of scout. If if there was like a, if you wanted to give it like militaristic terms, he was a sort of scout because he could always see or hear something coming. And due to his, you know, general cowardice uh, could turn him, could make himself unseen in a limited capacity. So he's kind of the doctor slash scout of the group because he actually has met some medical training and uh, and a bunch of book learning that doesn't do anyone any good. Well, if I recall, he does have some chemistry and science training. Hasn't really come up in, in this instance of him, but he has made explosions in the past. Yes, Reggie definitely knows how to make, make explosives. Like, uh, ammonium nitrate bombs were no, uh, are no mystery to him. And that's definitely not what killed his first pack back in the Siege of Austin. No one knows what happened there. Yeah, of course. They just died tragically in the Siege. Why would we even bring that up? That won't ever come up again. 
But finally, I'd like to know from your perspective, Ryan, how would you describe Reggie's journey, his personal story in the game sessions of Blood Covenant that we've recorded so far? Oh, it's one of, it's definitely the Zemisi story of transformation. It's taking someone who had, I mean, Reggie had a sort of a skewed ethic set in the first place. That didn't come up terribly much during his time as a human. But, you know, he was already in a very dire situation before he was embraced. And that has only ramped up and escalated and kind of ground away at his psyche. So his transformation was that of learning to be okay with transformation because he has he started out very rigid and kind of set in his his ways and his thought process but you know there's this once you can sort of mold yourself and mold your mold others to how you see fit it was really coming to terms with first of all that and second of all you're not human anymore which he was a staunch atheist slash humanist you know he was a hard materialist the the day before he walked into the night in question well thanks so much for talking with me ryan i really cannot wait for people to see the twists and the turns that reggie goes through because he really does go on a transformative trip throughout the story that we've recorded and I really like where he's gone and what he's gotten up to. And I think everyone's going to really enjoy getting to know this strange guy. Oh, me too. I'm very curious how people will react to his little journey. Well, now that you've had the opportunity to meet everyone, we hope that you are excited and looking forward to following the story of this terribly dysfunctional vampire family as they navigate a task that just might be a little bit beyond them. We'll be dropping the first two episodes next Wednesday, March 24th, on our podcast and YouTube channels. And new episodes will come out every Wednesday after that until the end of Season 1. And if you'd like to hear more, you can come to our Patreon at patreon.com slash simulacrastudios, where all the episodes are posted for our patrons, as well as the raw recording files for both Season 1 and Season 2 for our $10 and up patrons. Season 2 has been recorded, but we need your support in order to make it a reality. So please consider becoming a patron to help us bring Season 2 to life. Thank you for listening, and we hope to see you on the dark and cold streets of Montreal in the world of darkness.